panel is going to be chaired by the founder of uh, Fireproof Library, which provides a platform for people from marginalized communities to challenge dogma, superstition, and advocate for human rights through its Secular Voices campaign. Sarah Price is chairing the panel, so please give them a warm welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sarah Peace. Sarah it's Peace. such a pleasure to be here, to be in the company of so many friends and so many of my heroes. I want to thank Mariam for that privilege. Just before I um, introduce our panelists, I would just like to share a, a quote that we can all relate to from the Holy Quran. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a quote from Michael Palin of Monty Python. We all saw what's happened to Salman Rushdie, and none of us want to get into that. It's a pity, but that's the way it is. There are people out there without a sense of humor, and they're heavily armed. We can argue that for the same reason why we haven't had a Muhammad version of the life of Brian is the same reason why the art world has not had its version of Piss Christ. So for anybody who doesn't know the Piss Christ artwork is an infamous piece by and Andre Serrera in which he dips an emblem of Christ into a, a, a box of urine. It is clear that across all mediums of artistic expression, whether there is comedy, music, film, literature, or visual arts, there seems to be an unspoken but operative de, de facto blasphemy law, which exempts Islam or Islamic customs from discourse altogether. In situations where creators have challenged these impositions and have been met with violence, the response of the press has often been to retreat rather than defend the right to free expression. In the case of Charlie Hebdo, despite headline coverage recognizing the massacre as an attack on freedom, no British print newspaper published the cartoons in full. As with the London Pride controversy, or in the Goldsmith case, organizers and institutions seem to place offense as more important than fundamental human rights. But these series of events in, in themselves are not surprising. As is often the case, what emerges is a tendency in which Western liberals who were born and raised in an atmosphere of relative democratic stability, who have their rights enshrined in the constitution or asserted by the rule of law, have become accustomed to the guarantee of their civil liberties by default. As we speak, we have bloggers languishing in jail, we have others detained indefinitely without trial. We have heads rolling, but some seem to be increasingly unaware or indifferent to the battles that were fought in order for them to gain their own freedoms. Which is why more often than not, the most fearless advocates for free expression in the 21st century are those who operate within repressive or theocratic regimes or those who have fled those societies, which is why I'm delighted to host this panel of artists, activists, writers, comedians, and musicians from all around the world who are fearlessly using their work as a platform to challenge these ideas. Our first speaker is an award-winning playwright who has written extensively for the stage, screen, and radio, whose challenging and critically acclaimed work often opens to sold-out crowds Please join me in welcoming Gurpritz Kurbati. Thank As, you. Sorry, I'll introduce all of our speakers and then you can join turns. Our second speaker is a stand up comedian, writer, and campaigner whose shows have toured the UK and abroad and is a regular fixture on British TV and radio. Please welcome Kate Smirkwake. Our third speaker is a Tunisian filmmaker, advocate of freedom of, from religion, and a champion of women's autonomous rights, 
who, because of her work for the last few years, has been exiled in France. Please welcome Nadia Elfani. <laughs> Following that, we have a performance artist, human and animal rights advocate, and founder of the Secular Feminist Front. She's a Norwegian of Pakistani descent based in Oslo. Please welcome Shabana Rahman. We also have singer, songwriter, secular activist, and creator of the first self-defined atheist album, who also performed on this stage last night, Shelley Segal. <laughs> and finally, an award-winning body artist, MUA Extraordinaire, and visual creator experimenting with the potential of art and science to empower and fuel the imagination. Please welcome Victoria Guggenheim. <laughs> so we'll hear in turn from our speakers and we'll have a discussion amongst the panel and then go into the audience for questions. Hi, so uh, my name is Gapreet Corbati. Um, I'm a playwright and screenwriter. Um, my, I was born here. I'm second generation British Asian. Uh, my parents were working class immigrants who came over here in the 1960s. Um, and I come from a background, a family background, where what you see or what you perceive is deemed to be the most important thing. It doesn't really matter what's going on behind closed doors. Silence is golden. Um, questioning, provocation, and speaking out, certainly by women, is not seen to be acceptable. Um, and I've paid a price for doing that in my own personal life by speaking out about certain things. Um, I've been disowned by my family. I have no contact with my family anymore. Um, and so my art, consequently, has become my voice. Um, as a writer, I'm interested in telling stories that are under the surface of what we see. And some of my work, not all of my work, but some of my work is concerned with saying what we perceive to be unsayable. Uh, most notably, in 2004, I wrote a play called Bejdi, Dishonor which was um, on at the Birmingham Repertory Theatre. And the play explored the subject of sexual abuse in the Sikh community. Crucially, I chose to set the play in a Gurdwara, which is a Sikh temple. And uh, while we were rehearsing the play, word got out about um, that we were doing this play and that it was set in a Gurdwara. And um, before we knew it, there were daily demonstrations and protests outside the theater. The play opened and audience members and box office staff were called names and intimidated. Um, I remember a banner which read, um, shame on Sikh playwright for her corrupt imagination. Um, uh, the theatre managers were in daily contact with the police and they employed a security firm to keep the theatre safe. Um, so, you know, we were carrying on doing the play, um, walking in every day to protests and demonstrations. And uh, there was one time where there was one particularly nasty outburst directed towards me. And one of the elders, one of the Sikh uh, male elders, approached me. And he apologized for um, you know, the names that um, this man had called me. And um, he said, you know, when I see your name on the posters here, and at the time I was writing for a show called EastEnders, and he said, I've seen your name on the credits of EastEnders, you know, and I feel so proud of you, you know, because you write for EastEnders. Um, but why do you have to do this? Why do you have to write this play? And why do you have to set it in a Gurdwara? Why can't you set it in a community center? And um, I turned to him and I said, as strongly as you feel that I should not do this, that is as strongly as I feel that I should. And that should be okay, you know, for you to feel that. And for me to feel this. Um, 
Uh, one other thing I want to say about, about that is after the first read-through, um, the lead actress approached me. This is when we were in rehearsals. There is a, it, it is quite a disturbing piece of work, and there is a scene in which um, she is attacked in the Gurdwara by a group of women. And she said to me, Capri, that is the scene that people are going to find really brutal and really difficult. To this day, nobody has ever raised any objections about that scene. All the objections about the play were to do with the religious setting and the use of religious symbols. Um, and I find that really sad, you know. Nobody objected to, you know, this woman being abused in this horrific way. Um, but, you know, because there was um, an image of the holy book on the stage, people found that to be a problem. So a week into the play opening, there was a massive demonstration. Protesters um, got onto the stage and um, the show was closed for the night because the police said that they couldn't they couldn't keep the building safe. Um, a few days later, uh, the police told me to leave my home because there'd been threats against me. Um, and later on that day, a few hours later, um, the Birmingham rep decided to pull the play and not continue its run. So it's subsequently become um, a, a kind of you know, a, a kind of cause celebre about freedom of expression. I, I mean, I came home a few weeks later, the play had, had been pulled, um, and I came home and there were bars on my window, there was CCTV outside my flat, and it was a really difficult time. Um, but if anything, it made me want to write more and my experiences have shown me that freedom of expression is precious. It is a fundamental right. And when it's taken away, there is nothing left but a, an abject silence. Um, and the only way of filling that void is to keep creating and for me to carry on writing. And I believe that I have the right to share my insides with the outside world. Um, I also wrote a, pay, a play in 2010, which was on at Soho and at Coventry, and at the same time the police asked the artistic director to pull the play because they were worried about the content, and they were worried that there would be problems. There weren't any problems. Um, in 2013, I wrote a play for the BBC. Um, compliance were concerned that a few lines might be offensive, so they took lines out of the play. Um, and what I've seen from my experiences, I mean, you know, I don't just go around writing loads of con controversial work, I might you know, add, I also write for the archers, um, but um, is that I think when people say they're offended, it's actually the, f it's covering up, those words cover up the fear that they feel inside. It's a fear of being challenged um, their own fear of maybe not being who they think they are. Um, and equally, I've experienced that fear um, in the institutions who are putting work on. And this is really important because it is those institutions that actually choose. It's the galleries, it's the museums, it's the theatres, it's the broadcast broadcasters who actually choose the work that we all see. So it's, it's about the artists, but it's also about the institutions. Um, I think art's function is not to maintain the status quo, but to change the world. And some people are never, ever going to want that to happen. Um, and I suppose what I want to say in conclusion is that artists must have the freedom to explore the extremities of their imagination, to provoke and poke around amidst the dirt and filth of the human condition. If not, art becomes sanitized and homogenous because it is only born of fear. And our institutions must also leap in with artists, be brave enough to put on complex work that they believe in, and if necessary, use their imaginations if they have cause to defend it. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kate. Uh, brilliant, thank you very much. Oh, I'm not used to talking sitting down. It's quite exciting. Um, 
So, yeah, hi, I'm Kate Smurthwaite, and I'm a comedian and a comedy writer and um, a campaigner and activist and all sorts of kind of related things, a newspaper columnist sometimes. Um, I've written a bit for the BBC. I've, I actually, interestingly, um, I was censored only once by the BBC. Apparently, I, cannot, I can talk about rape, but not anal rape. Uh, they were very clear that there's only one sort of rape allowed on the BBC. It's pretty tight. Um, and... Uh, I mean, I wasn't talking about things you should try after lunch, you know, like I was uh, obviously talking about abuse and stuff. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, and I feel like maybe I should start with a trigger warning. Let's do a trigger warning. That's appropriate, isn't it? Uh, here's my trigger warning. Um, I think everybody in this room, perhaps directly or indirectly, has been affected by gun crime. And if you're offended by the word trigger, I've already said it. Um, so comedy and, so here's the thing. Um, there's a wonderful piece of research out of the US that shows that jokes have a bigger influence on people's opinions than facts do, which is terrifying, isn't it? Absolutely terrifying. And you should, if you find yourself laughing at something, you just stop and check it's real first. Um, and the worst thing is they demonstrated this in what you might call the inverted commas wrong direction. Um, they took a big group of guys and they asked them for their attitudes about women. Um, about women in the workplace, about women in relationships, about equality between the sexes. Um, and they ranked these guys from kind of one to a hundred for how sexist they were in terms of their attitudes. And half of the group were then exposed to some inverted commas facts about differences between the genders. And the other half were exposed to sexist jokes. And the facts did almost nothing and the sexist jokes had an enormous impact and they came away with more sexist attitudes. Um, so the good news is that comedy can influence and the bad news is, oh God, don't use it for the wrong reason. Um, and it's really interesting um, when we look at it in that context that it is really powerful. Um, and, and on the one hand, you know, I mean, I, I'm certainly not in a world of trying to say, therefore don't tell the wrong joke. Um, but it's interesting the extent to which free speech is, is, is wielded in comedy. It feels like the, the, the com free speech is like the get out of jail card in comedy a lot of the time. I went on TV um, about five years ago and said that I disagreed with or I, I didn't like a joke that Frankie Boyle had told. I wasn't trying to, um, you know, reinvent the wheel. He made a joke about how some famous women are ugly. And I was like, well, that's lazy and it's, you know, and it's pointless. And, you know, women get so much more shit than guys. I just think that's not a very good choice of joke to put on air. And I received thousands of messages going, what about his free speech? <laughs> and I was like, what about mine? <laughs> to say that I disagree with it. And this is the thing, he has an absolute right to say it. And I have an absolute right to say I'm bored of his second series and I wish they'd switch the damn thing off. That's, that's how life works. That's what the whole point of free speech is. And perhaps my sort of biggest claim to be on this panel is, is the Goldsmiths incident. Um, uh, for those of you who missed it, and, and I guess that's quite few because half of you were there. Um, uh, so a couple of years ago, I was supposed to perform a show I'd written about free speech at Goldsmiths um, University, and, um, and then they cancelled it because I have the wrong opinion um, about the sex industry or possibly Islam or possibly something else that they weren't quite sure about, but they were pretty sure that if I set foot on campus grounds, something would stop rotating on its axis. And, um, and, and we went through hoops and hoops and hoops and it was all over the papers and a lot of fuss was made about it and eventually, uh, thanks to uh, Asher and his team, we managed to go back there and they managed to sabotage that as well, three times no less. Um, and uh, then Mariam was finally uh, speaking there and rang me up on the day and said, I'd, I'd love a support act, why don't you come down? And we've just been trying to use every option to keep doing it. But um, what's interesting is that, I mean, I've been invited to so many events to talk about how the people at Goldsmiths are idiots and they're wrong and all this kind of stuff. And I think they were idiots and I think they were wrong. But I also think that being an idiot and getting something wrong and perhaps even learning from it is probably the whole point of being a student. 
Like that's what universities are for. And, hey, and hey. so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm all, f I'm all for the conversation about how people are wrong. But, it's, but, that, but we should also remember that it's okay to be wrong and then learn something and move along and get it right next time. And they have a right to say something that I disagree with and do something I disagree with. And I have a right to respond to it. Um, and, and on the whole, I would say that yes, you know, Goldsmiths messed me about and it was a problem. Um, but my ability to get up on stage and say the things that I want um, is affected much less by a handful of young idiots at Goldsmiths than it is by a huge swathe of people out there um, on, I mean, and I, I won't even, but like people who are men's rights activists, anti-feminists, people who simply find that the one thing more offensive than somebody with an opinion is somebody who backs it up with a vagina, um, that whole world of things. Um, I, I censor myself much less because I'm afraid of what Goldsmith's students might think and much more because I'm afraid of what the internet backlash is going to be and I'm not the only person in this room who knows what that feels like. Um, and I was actually on a panel about a year ago with um, Caroline Criado Perez, the feminist campaigner whose work you may be familiar with. And we were talking about internet abuse. And, uh, and she said something fascinating. She said, have you noticed that the rape threats are never about your vagina? They are always about your throat and your mouth. And she's absolutely bang on. And if that doesn't tell us what is fundamentally uh, going on there, then, uh, then nothing does. So um, I think there's a lot to be challenged there. Free speech is not easy it's you know in, in a sense it is we should have it and in another sense it's a really complicated subject that we need to have conferences we need to talk about and I'm really glad we're here to do it next we'll hear from uh, Nadia okay I, I'm sorry the English is not my language so I, 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 I I'll be not so fluently like you and so it's not so easy for me to to speak in English and to express my, myself. It's, it's better to see my movies, but maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe I have to speak. Yeah, okay, I'll speak. Uh, I grew up in Tunisia um, because I, I'm becoming, I'm becoming yeah, old now, you know, and I remember it was the 60s. And I think, you know, when I speak now with the youth in, in France or, or all over the world, that uh, we were living, you know, another life in 60s, 70s, also maybe in the 80s. We were, we were really dreaming to another world, you know. We were really thinking that we will change the world. And after those two days, you know, um, hearing all the, this um, testimony and uh, I, I feel like, you know, I, I don't want to be sad. I don't want to be pessimist, you know, because it's not my character. And uh, I also make a lot of joke, you know, in my movies and some humor also when I speak about politics. But I think the, the time is really, uh, how do you say it, hard now. And be an artist now in... Uh, south of Mediterranean, because maybe we can divide the world like this, you know. You have North Mediterranean and South Mediterranean, englobing Africa and uh, all the Arab worlds, and uh, after you have Asia and everything. But it's really complicated, because you, you speak with the youth, and uh, you, you, you seem to be, you know, always free in your mind. And the people saying to you, no, it's not good, you know, to say this, and it's not time to say that, and not this uh, manner to express, you know. It's what happened with my movies, you know, because when I made my first short movie, it was in 90, in Tunisia, and uh, the fundamentalism Islamist was growing up in Tunisia, like in Algeria, and uh, I made a movie about two women, you know, sleeping uh, in the same bed, you know, and uh, talking about the difference of the sex. And uh, it was something like very subversive, you know, and I was really afraid because I was a little bit more young than now, younger than now. And uh, sh sh screening my movie in Tunis, 
uh, you know, in front of uh, something like 1,500 person. It was something like, oh my God, you know, they will kill me. And, uh, and with this sense of humor of Tunisia, I was really shocked, you know, but in the good way, because the, the film was really well received. And after at the university, I became like, you know, a Nikon, because I made this movie. And uh, after two or three years, I made another movie, uh, you know, it was feature film, feature. And uh, I, I show women, you know, uh, going into a bar and taking a beer in front of the men, because at this time, too, there is only men in the bar. So you have to imagine, you know, a country where uh, <laughs> when you are a woman and you want to drink a beer, it's like a political act, you know, and you go in a bar and I say, okay, and I ask a beer, and I stay. So I, I put it in a movie, you know, and it was like, oh, oh, oh something not good, you know, with Nadia Alfani in Tunisia, showing this country like that with those women, you know, drinking a beer on the bar and, uh, you know, with this relation very uh, amb ambiguous, ambiguous, yeah, we can say, with the man, you know, is she a lesbian or not, you know, she, uh, and she's drinking, you know, and everything, so after Oh, okay, let's go forward, and after 10 years, I made my first feature movie, Bedouin Hacker, and uh, for me, it was about freedom, and because we were in dictatorship, and I can't speak about freedom in Tunisia, so I was, like, you know, using a satellite and everything, and a hacker Tunisian woman hacking, you know, satellite, and making, um, um, cutting the program, TV program in France, and making you know, all the program in, in France. And um, it was like, you know, talking about freedom for Tunisian people. And I, I thought at this time, it was in 2002, and uh, I thought, you know, the youth people will understand me. But they didn't understand me. Why? Because there is a scene in the movie, woman drinking, you know, vodka at the, at the bottle, and uh, in front of the father, you know, of the family. And this is something was really for me like a shock, you know, because I understood at this time that I was really uh, uh, separate with the mentality of the youth in Tunisia. There is no more connection between us, between my generation and this new generation, you know. It was 15 years before now. And the people really aggressed me in the, in the street and they didn't receive the movie and they didn't understand nothing because only this scene and another scene uh, of women nude and uh, women making love and, uh, you know, something you cannot show in a Tunisian movie and, or in an Arab movie, you know. And at this time I decided and I, I, I understood that I, I, I have to leave Tunisia and come to France because of the dictatorship, but not only the dictatorship, it's because the society uh, became more and more conservative and more and more uh, agree with the Islamists, you know? So after revolution, uh, I, and I, I, I continue my movie from France in Tunisia, and uh, after revolution, I, I made this famous movie, I don't know if you heard about it, about neither Allah nor Master, you know, a documentary about uh, the place of the religion and how the dictatorship is using the religion to maintain the people, you know, under power. And when the revolution came and I thought, you know, we will change Tunisia. It's because I was always with my mind, you know, from the 70s. <laughs> I really thought that we can change the world, you know, and we can change Tunisia. So at, at this time, the Islamist was really powerful in Tunisia, and they forbidden my movie because they, they make violence and they, they, um, uh, they, how do you say, they destroy a cinema and they, uh, they uh, threatening by me by death and they put charge in justice against me and everything. and. Uh, so it's only to tell you that 
I, ho I still hope that we can change the world, but please support the artists because I think is only the artists can cross up the line to push the frontier and to make more space for the others to be free. Next, we'll hear from Shabana. Thank you. Um, my name is Shabana Rehman, and I am a lift-up comedian. <laughs> I became a lift-up comedian because I lifted a mullah. <laughs> and that became uh, actually art by mistake. <laughs> And it wasn't a usual mullah, it was uh, a terrorist mullah. Uh, I'm going to tell the whole story at my comedy show tonight, but first of all, uh, I really want to sh tell all of you uh, that um, uh, for several of us, this has been a very dramatic journey to be an artist, and it's a very lonely journey as well sometimes, to, so to be here, to feel the connection with all of you, I just must say I feel very, very grateful. So thank you for making this happen. Thank you so much. So um, I started as a stand-up comedian 20 years ago. Um, when I started, I was surrounded by white male Norwegian comedians. And they were talking about how to get drunk, how to get laid, and immigrants. <laughs> so I did the same. <laughs> <laughs> so while uh, I've... Uh, uh, my experience was while people were laughing at the other Norwegian comedians, I was receiving totally different reactions. Uh, I grew up in Oslo. Uh, I come from a very liberal family, uh, and they were very supporting. And they just thought it's great and very funny that I will, uh, wanted to work with comedy. But I realized that my freedom of speech wasn't the same as the Norwegian comedians I grew up with. And at the beginning, I didn't understand that because I was home in Oslo. That was my community. And I wasn't a political activist. I wasn't a feminist. I joined comedy because I love to laugh with the society I feel home at. And then the threats started to come. You know, when an American comedian do a great show, he says, I kill that audience. But my experience was, was that there were people from the audience who said, we killed that comedian. <laughs> And in the beginning, I didn't know what, how to handle this. They were telling me, you become a Norwegian whore? Who do you think you are? You blackie, are you Norwegian, or are you Pakistani? Have you forgotten your roots? So I have choices. I could stop doing what I was doing. I chose something totally different. That was my first performance art. They were harassing me, my body, my freedom of speech. I didn't do anything wrong that went up on stage and speak into a mic and make people laugh. And people want to want me dead because of that, because I was Norwegian in a Norwegian culture. So I went up on stage I took off all of my clothes and I painted my body with the Norwegian flag. 
And I told them back, this is my body, this is the country I grew up in. What's your problem? Okay, it doesn't lead to any less dead threats. <laughs> but I have a plan. I had a plan with that. Because people were telling me, you're so brave, you're so controversial. They, were, they were, weren't telling that to the Norwegian male comedians, they were saying that to me. And I wanted to show them, no, it's not me who are controversial. It's the reaction who are controversial. The people who want you dead because you were making comedy who are controversial. <laughs> and then I met the mullah in my life. <laughs> <laughs> he is a refugee in, in Norway. The Norwegian law is protecting him. So he was in a nightclub to promote his book, which was um, promoting Sharia laws. He was using his freedom of speech to denounce freedom of speech <laughs> <laughs> in a very same nightclub where comedians were doing stand-up comedy. And he was telling the audience that Norwegians have no reason to be afraid of him. And I believed him. So I went up on stage and I said, I believe you. Let me show that. And then I lifted him up. <laughs> well, I thought a mullah in a nightclub will be the news. But no, it was the lifting a mullah who went the world around. That actually never happened in the world history, a girl lifting a mullah. <laughs> so Norwegian weightlifting team <laughs> honored me with a prize. <laughs> <laughs> I will be, be short because there's a long story of what happened to the mullah and me. <laughs> if we can write books about that. <laughs> But the, my, the experience I really want to share with you, which is still making me think what this is all about and what we are fighting against, is that I never received a single death threat after lifting the mullah. But showing ownership to my own body in public, I receive, I, I can't count them anymore. I receive so much death threats, shooting at my family's restaurant. I still being harassed, even if that ha happened 20 years ago. A woman can show her strength. She can be stronger than a woman in public. She can lift mullahs, but she can't own her own body. What is this about? After 20 years, I am happy to see that I'm meeting people from a new generation who understand, who just don't see a naked body, but who reads the message. And I'm happy that I'm still alive. I'm here spreading, still can speak and do comedy and work against violence. I believe that comedy can liberate ourselves. Comedy can be a very effective game changer and I believe that non-violent action through comedy, it's the best and most funny way to fight for our rights, for our freedom of speech. And I am so happy that they, the threats, the harassment didn't stop me doing that, that I'm here and connecting with people and meeting understandment here, so thank you so much, and I hope I see.
I love to see you tonight. Thank you. We can't wait to hear more in your comedy show. Next to speak will be Shelley. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Shelley Siegel. I am a performing musician. I sing and play guitar and uh, I also write songs. And uh, my introduction to music was through our work setting. My father has a function band, a Jewish wedding band, and performs you know, bar mitzvahs and anniversaries and weddings. And so I learned early on that music was a really integral part of everyday life, um, not just a high art, but part of work, part of pleasure, part of celebration and recreation and a way of marking milestones in life and a way of bringing community together. Um, but in Orthodox Judaism, women are not, not allowed to sing unaccompanied. Uh, so even though I had a moderate level of observance in my family, uh, religious censorship was part of my musical experience from a very early age. Uh, at the functions with my father's band, I might not be allowed to sing uh, or have to wait at least until the more observant guests would go home. Uh, at synagogue, I wasn't allowed to lead the congregation in song like my father and my brother. And so my gender dictated my role as a performer and as a person uh, and my expression in all of these vital, integral parts of life and community. Um, I believe when there's censorship that it harms both parties. Uh, I felt degraded by this scenario and I, I believe that it degraded my community at the same time. Uh, for some, just to be a woman practicing art is resistance. Resistance to censorship and resistance to control. For me, part of my artistic expression uh, and practice is to communicate my feminism. I have a right to be here, to assert myself, to sing, to express my thoughts and ideas. Uh, songwriting initially started for me as self-expression, as a way of consolidating my ideas. Uh, but as I began to perform my own material and communicate my ideas, it continued to be about that expression, but it became about communication and resistance and challenge and empowerment, self-empowerment and the empowerment of others. Um, I challenged the community and the ideas that I was brought up with, and I challenged the wider community as well. Uh, my first album was called An Atheist Album, which I wrote after leaving my tradition and... Uh, you know, I express my newfound worldview. And uh, I love having a, a strong reaction to this music. I think as an artist, you know, you, cra you crave a reaction, a strong reaction. And uh, whether that be, you know, from people who agree with you, who feel empowered to hear their worldview reflected back at them, um, or to people who strongly disagree with you, you know, you're making them think about things and think in a different way than they want to and hopefully that um, can stay and challenge in some way. Um, I think that art humanises the individual and their perspective. It elevates an idea. It engages your freedom of expression. It's a form of rebellion. And I want to empower and to challenge. I want to raise awareness and discussion and debate. And uh, I want to use my art to broach painful and confronting ideas and conversations that people wouldn't be prepared to engage with in a personal dialogue, but are maybe able to digest through an artistic medium. Uh, as I said earlier, I believe that censorship of expression harms the society as a whole, those who want to communicate ideas and those who need to hear them. My mind and my art is constantly informed and motivated and changed by other artists and activists that I meet and if we're unable to learn from each other and be challenged by each other, then we stagnate and our society stagnates. And art is unable to fulfill its role to reflect and push society forward in its understanding of itself, the good and the bad and the depraved, and in grasping itself and what it can become.
We'll hear from our last speaker, Victoria. Hi, guys. Um, I have a lot to say on art as resistance. I think if you want to bolster a point, you need art. And everyone from McDonald's to even terrorist groups know this. Um, my CMB body paintings were covered at Pride largely because it was seen as something controversial. And this is, this is very important because every single person is, is a visual person. We have reptilian brains and just as people who are mathematicians and scientists can see beauty in an equation, the everyday man can see the beauty in art. Art can bring an immediacy to something that's distant. Public art especially is participatory and you can't get away from it, it's confrontational. And when I did 99 Red Balloons last night, a person here ended up holding a balloon with the name of his friend who'd been assassinated on it. Another woman broke down crying. But it's these incidents that demonstrate the power that art as resistance can have when used correctly. And demonstrating these things and protesting these things is resistance. With body painting, I see it as autonomy, therapy for those who've been abused, and almost as a military strategy. In some circumstances, it circumvents nudity laws when you're fully covered so you can protest and they can't arrest you for public nudity. A naked and painted body is something that precious few can turn away from. And of course, some social police will tell you it's sick or abnormal for wanting to do it. And some people will say it's superficial. Art is never superficial when it's mastered. A beautiful um, scientist, Jean-Pierre Changeau, on a Carter Lecture of Art, actually evidenced it's an entire brain experience. You get an aesthetic jolt, and then your prefrontal cortex kicks in, and you start asking questions about how the art came to be there. When a piece of art is done masterfully, like a Turner, it can generate the same feelings as being in love. A friend of mine, when I was younger, said that I was like the walking resistance to her and I very much took that to heart. Because no matter what happens, and through my personal aesthetic choices, I will not kowtow to what society wants me to be, and I will not worry about them taking offense. Because to me, body art is the ultimate form of protest, and it's important. It's important that human beings utilize their body and reclaim their body from abuse, reclaim their body from being told it's not good enough, and actually use it as a force for good. It's also a resistance from thought policing because people will want to tell you what's normal and what's not. I have a non-neurotypical mind. I'm on the autistic spectrum and I suffer very badly from bipolar. But actually, if you know how to utilize these properly, they can give you an advantage. It can be a natural resistance to a herd mentality. I fought against people my entire life saying this is not how normal people think and trying to shut down the way my brain processes things. And actually I realized later on in life that actually thinking about large quantities of information, having a big mental map, and actually looking at ways to do things differently aren't a source of pathology. They're a source of inspiration. They're a source of changing things. They're a source of making things better for the world around us if we use them correctly. The majority, I think, as well, can never be right. A zeitgeist can never be right because the mainstream profiteers through cutting down little pieces of information, turning them into these terrible bite-sized sound bites, and having them perpetuate across social media. You will never get to the truth this way. I think art and science, when they come together, will give us more truth and beauty than looking at these stupid, bite-sized pieces of information that Twitter and Facebook will give us. <laughs> I also like to see what I do as a sort of choreographed ma madness, if you like, a sort of, um, I think it's called Genusian processing in psychology. Because you need novel ways of thinking in order to raise the standard of it. It encourages new ways of questioning, new ways of creating metaphors and similes, and enables you to be seeing both the similarities and differences within and between things. And I think a lot of people who are non-neurotypical, a lot of people who are different or awkward or just benignly weird, 
have issues with not just information processing, but how we're taught things um, from an educational level. There's a beautiful book, which if you haven't got already, I would implore you to get, which is called Arts with the Brain in Mind. And it demonstrates that when disenfranchised children, people who have been abused and people who are autistic, um, are actually given art to do. They go from disinterested learners, people who don't care about education and the world around them, to information hunter-gatherers. Because when you're giving them the capacity to do art, you're actually giving them a capacity for autonomy to go out and get the information on their own terms, to think for themselves, and to actually enable truth and beauty to come their way. It's a vital part of education when done right. I also like to engage when I'm creating a piece of work in something I call the sandbox of the mind. It's very Python-esque, and you can have a little sandbox mentally in your head where you can entertain an idea, no matter how absurd or how weird or unusual, and it will never affect your thinking in a, in a detrimental way. I'm very much for aesthetic freedom, and I'm doing this because we still don't have what I'd like to call equal clothing rights to be as a desk. When I had my head shaved and I was walk walking along in a spiky jacket with a friend of mine, a man suddenly started crouching and I thought maybe he was drunk and taking a leak. And instead, what I heard was fucking faggot. And the guy punched me so hard in the head, I fell down on the floor and ended up with a concussion so bad, I missed my father's wedding the day after. So I'd like to issue this, uh, this little bit of a war cry, if you like. I'm interested in how things are, what we can become, and how much we have in terms of human potential. I want to test those limits. If you're, an, if you're another artist, if you're a scientist, if you're a protester, if you're an activist, I want to work with you. I want to create art that will change the world. And I believe if we all work together, we can actually change the world and make it a better place for everybody in it. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think in many ways you summarize a lot of what has been said across the panel, but I just wanted us to go back and maybe pick up, some, pick up on some, some other issues. I think the gender as a, as a uh, site of resistance, you know, the body, the female body is an issue that comes up um, repeatedly, even though we've approached it from different perspectives. Kate talked about uh, violence against women, being excused with free speech, but I think that it's really important to see the potential of that free speech in pushing back against uh, theocracy. So I, I, I wondered if you wanted to make some comments on that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, I think the real problem is that 99.9% .9 of people who talk about free speech have absolutely no idea what it means. Um, I hear exactly this, people talk about Frankie Boyle's second series not being recommissioned and they go, what about his free speech? And they haven't stopped to think that if free speech means you're entitled to three series on BBC channels, it's going to create a little bit of mayhem. You know, we're here celebrating free speech and yet, out of respect, you've all remained silent for at least the last 20 minutes. How is this? Well, it's because if we didn't, um, we wouldn't have a conference. We'd, we'd be having a brawl by now. It would all have kicked off. Um, the idea, um, and, then, and then there's a sort of sense of like, fr it's free speech, so I can say anything at all. Well, you can, um, but what we're really trying to protect is the right to express ideas and to challenge thinking and this kind of thing. When we see 10 children shouting something racist at another child, we don't go, oh, free speech. We go, oh, bullying. And it seems so obvious and intuitive to know the difference. Um, and yet, so many people who sort of just whip out this free speech card um, on a whim to defend all sorts of obnoxious things that they've said and to try to tell you that you don't have the right to respond to things that you're furious about and that you're horrified by and that you think are objectively wrong um, is where the problem lies. Um, so I think, I think fundamentally what we have to do is actually understand what free speech is um, in order to defend it effectively. And I think, um, yeah, I, I think maybe we're in a good place for that at this, at this point anyway. Well, what I was trying to get at is the danger 
of trying to curb the speech of others because it is, it is violent against women or because we don't like it, because we're taking away our own rights to be able to use that free speech as a platform to challenge bad ideas. So that, that was more what I was getting at. If, as artists and creators, I, I, don't, I, I question how healthy it is to to try to curb the speech of others to protect women's rights, because I think that's minorities need free speech the most. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with you. I, 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 I'll, I'll stop talking and somebody else will talk in a minute, but I, I wouldn't disagree with you. Uh, but I don't think, like, I certainly am not an advocate, for example, for some sort of new draconian law about the internet. I'm actually an advocate for the existing laws on harassment actually being applied and the police actually getting off their asses and doing something Agreed. when death threats come through. I don't think we need a new law that says, oh, don't, don't say naughty words on Twitter. That's not helping anybody because actually I want to say naughty words on Twitter so that I can respond to them and say, this is what this should mean and this is why you should say this. And this, is what it, this is where it comes from. This is why this word is good or bad or useful in this context and not useful in another context. I, I certainly don't think we should bring in sort of more layers of law, but I do think there are people out there who are already breaking the law and people are going, oh well, women don't make that much of a fuss, let's not do anything about it. But in many ways, our own actions are breaking the law. Like what Inna does is breaking the law every day. And so I, I still think that there's room for discourse. I wonder if anybody else wants to chip in. Um, you know, in, in a dictatorship, the first thing they do, you know, it's censorship. And uh, I think it's because when you touch the artist and when you touch the intellectual, that they always uh, are the first person, you know, uh, victims of the violence of the dictatorship of, or, or of the terrorism. You can see now also in the West, you know, not on, only in our countries. It's because it's the way to show the limits for the old society so they know, you know, the artist and the intellectual in general, they are the people who is uh, taking out, you know, all the new ideas or experimental ideas or, uh, you know, uh, trying, trying to, to, to show another way and to, to think for the people and by the art, by the reflection and everything. So we are the first victims of the terrorism, you know, you can, you can, we have to remember, you know, Algeria, Jamila knows very well, you know, in 90, when they start, you know, with the, the violence of the Islamists, uh, the West didn't care, you know, really what happened in Algeria because, f because, you know, it was too far or, or because it's Islamic country, you know, it, it doesn't uh, regard us in, in the West, but, for me, it was like a laboratory, you know, in, in Algeria to, to show how in a country with the violence of the terrorism, Islamist terrorism, and also of the, uh, the, the state, the power of the, the politic power, they, they, they start to kill the artist. They start to kill the director of the, the um, uh, uh, how do you say it? Oh my God! Uh, huh? News? Uh, not newspaper. They they start to kill, you know, the 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 director de 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 la Maison des Arts, etc. And and also writers, you know. And uh, after also, you know, newspaper and everything. And it was like ten years violence in Algeria, and it was like silent in the West, you know. I think it was almost now 25 years before, and I'm afraid, you know, in 20, 25 years after, we will, we will have the same thing that it's arriving to Algeria now, that there is no more freedom for the artist, for the, the writers, for the journalists, for the, you know, it's, it's not really dictatorship because it's like, smooth dictator, dictatorship, you know, because the, the, you don't have to persecute really the people because they are afraid about the violence. It, it's what, what's it happening now in Tunisia after, uh, after revolution, the people, because of my story, not only my story, you know, all the, all, uh, uh, 
other artists in Tunisia like dance, you know, or uh, comedian and everything. And now the people, they are not creating any more things, you know, subversive because they know the limits. So now they are like, you know, we don't need any more dictatorship because the people are afraid about the violence. And I think when I saw France now, what happened with Charlie Hebdo, what happened with uh, all this uh, terrorism, you know, that, oh, la, 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 be careful, you know, don't, don't go to this touchy uh, uh, thing, you know, but saying something about religion, about Islam, of course, because now around the world is only Islam making a problem, you know, because it's only, I'm sorry, but it's only Islam making terrorism for the moment and large terrorism, you know, but we forget yet that in Iraq, in Syria, they, they win, you know, they win. In, in Libya, <laughs> you, can, you can see, you know, in Libya, what's happening in Libya. I, I know it was not better before, but you know what is happening in Turkey. Be careful, it's coming, you know. You don't have to be afraid to speak and I, I say it again, support the artist. Can I just chime a little bit in on oh, censorship? Yeah, sorry, yeah. If, if Shabana comes in and, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I want to support that because um, it's my experience as well in, in Scandinavia. Um, you know, the, the growing uh, issue of self-censorship. Mm. And it is really um, scary because uh, if we can't, uh, if we start starting doing self-censorship in, in Europe, who will then speak, right? And it's... Uh, even if you're not um, killed as um, easily in, in Europe as you do in other countries because of using your freedom of speech, there are a lot of things happening who are, um, you know, s um, making you stop your uh, totally free way of, of thinking. You, are, you keep having second uh, thoughts uh, or you don't get enough work and um, also that, you know, we have this political left uh, and right issue. They are um, positioning themselves and uh, uh, trying to own artists and using artists in their political uh, ideologies, right? Uh, so uh, there are several ways they are uh, s um, stopping and making it difficult to be a totally free uh, artist and I think uh, our societies but also the world will uh, you know bleed for that uh, af even after Charlie Agreed. Hebdo that was really difficult to discuss this in in Norway because um, it, it's so easily and and you realize that is so many people with so much aggression who, who really doesn't understand that uh, Free thinking uh, is not the same that you are, uh, you know, uh, a free victim of harassment, right? Because if you are using your freedom of speech to think, to discuss issues like uh, uh, what Charlie Hebdo, um, I realize that they are telling me that, okay, then I can tell you whatever I want. So they are personal attacking you if you are, are discussing a general topic. And it's, it's, it's a big problem. Thank you. And Victoria? Yeah, so um, just generally in terms of censorship, I don't think um, art should really ever be censored just based on the fact that what you'll be doing is, let's say for example an artist wants to um, create a piece of work and you find it offensive. Um, I think Dawkins touched on this point yesterday. Um, that person's offense shouldn't ever trump your right to create art. That's your right as a human being to express yourself in that way because you're not causing harm to other people. All you're doing is perpetuating a thought. Mm. And that's, it's actually really vital that we get new ways of thinking and being into the world and new ways of examining things and breaking down information because otherwise we'll just stagnate. And um, just touching on that point, I want to go into a little bit um, of a cultural appropriation because actually... Um, I think that this whole idea um, of cultural appropriation with bunny repetitions um, is essentially 
It's censorship because it's anathema to mimetic production. It restricts the flow of ideas through censorship, usually through kind of societal piling on. So if someone posts something on Facebook like Katy Perry in a geisha outfit, they're going, oh no, it's terrible, it's cultural appropriation, how dare she? It's like, this is visual kinds, this is from Japan, come at me, bitch, seriously. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, I, I understand that it comes from, I, I guess, a place of, of wanting to protect people, but in so doing that, um, you actually, you censor people so much that it just, it becomes... Just, it, it becomes another tool of the oppressor if you do that. You're saying, you can't wear that, you can't do that, you can't say that, you can't create that. And before you know it, we're in a dictatorship, we're in a, a, a place where no one can express themselves. You know, and also in terms of things about, in, in, in terms of thought experiments as well, um, if you're thinking about things and you're upset about them, just you know, take a step back and it's okay to think about things merely because they're unpleasant, because thought experiments are vital. You have to think about things no matter how unpleasant and what could potentially happen. And you have to break dialogue on unpleasant topics. You have to break ground. You have to engage, because if you don't, we're not going to get anywhere. We're going to carry on going down this sawtooth mm -hmm. of decline in humanity and we can't allow that to happen. We just can't. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Having written in defense of cultural appropriation, I completely second that. I think we should move on to audience questions now. We're going to, going to take as many questions as possible because we only have 20 minutes left. So we'll take at least three or four questions and then come back to the panel. Just a couple of things, like two years ago here in London. I'm sorry, can you please speak up? Two years ago here in London, the, the Passions for Freedom ex uh, exhibition, they banned, they okay. pulled the Mimsy artwork because they said it's too, too expensive to insure. Last year in Canada, the French national broadcaster, Radio Canada, they were hosting a comedian uh, comedy award ceremony. A comedian was going to win an award and the insurance company said, no, we're not going to insure if you have this guy on because you'll get sued. So they gave him the award in absentia. So, I mean, like, what do you do now? Do you give insurance adjusters critique courses so they know what to critique? Like, like, like how do you stop that? Okay, let's go straight to the next question, please. Hello, my name is Hannah. Um, thank you so much for that panel. My question was, um, you get the sort of social justice warrior mentality and narrative amongst lots of very successful young entertainers, artists, so I'm thinking you're Lena Dunham types, Katy Perry. Um, and I was wondering if you guys feel betrayed because they've got such big audiences and they're perpetuating some very regressive ideas from a place of uh, quite a privileged place. So I was wondering if you could just, um, I, I, I'm not just saying those two figures, they're just two that come to mind, but would you be able to elaborate on your feelings towards maybe this culture of perpetuating SJW ideas in art? Yeah, any more? This has been such an interesting conference. I've had my hand up at every single panel. Anyway, I want to ask you guys a question about the phrase, and which has been incorporated in law, incitement to hatred, because I have real issues with this. First of all, does government have any business policing my emotions? No. I think it has much less business policing my emotions than it does my bowel movements, really. <laughs> Um, I mean, government should not be compelling my love, and nor should it be policing my hate, first of all, unless it's carried out in some sort of act that's illegal. Secondly, this whole concept of incitement, um, it, well, <laughs> completely undermines the liberal idea that we are autonomous, responsible, moral agents. So the other side of rights is responsibility and the idea that grown-ups can take responsibility for themselves, not claim that they've been incited to do something by someone else. This has a lot of overlap with honor and immodesty and such ideas that 
some people are responsible for other people's behaviors, which is nonsense. So I'd like to know what you think of that. Thanks. All right, thank you. Is anyone on the panel not familiar with the Passion for Freedom exhibition? So I can quickly explain. So a British artist, Bambi, made an artwork that was making fun of ISIS, but then the British police responded and said, well, if you choose to go ahead and show this work, you're on your own. You need to provide your own security, which of course they couldn't afford to because it would have cost 35,000 pounds, and in the end, they had to pull the work from the exhibition. That was the first question. The second one from Hannah was about social justice warrior narratives in which a lot of creative practitioners, filmmakers, are pushing this narrative that I suppose sells, you know, that makes them look good, that, you know, in which they defend minorities or they apologize for having dreadlocks or for braiding their hair, in which they just kind of prostrate in front of the minorities just to show how oh, liberal and non-racist they are. But of course, in, we know that this is it's a very superficial type of... Uh, of apology they put forward. And then the third question was about incitement to hatred. Should the government decide what this constitutes? Should we go from, from up there? Um, so what happened is that police uh, declined to uh, support security to an artist who were having an exhibition about ISIS? Yes, yeah, so in a way the police shifted the responsibility onto the artist. So rather than defend the artist to show the work, they said, well, you're on your own if you show it, and surely no reasonable person would have gone ahead and showed it, if that makes sense. So is, is your question around that? Yeah. If it happened like I understood it now, I think it's really crazy, because w if you are going to that direction, where will it stop? We have this huge Charlie Hebdo exhibition in Norway where uh, the police really did any, everything they could do to, uh, to promote security around uh, the exhibition. But the um, people who, were, uh, who arranged that decided that they can make any um, cartoons but not Mohammed. <laughs> so p police supported the security, but they still wanted to make cartoons about the whole Charlie Hebdo and terrorist issue, but not Mohammed. So something wrong still happens. So yeah, I think it's a problem. I, I think that going that direction is it's dangerous. We never know where it stops, but I it's censorship. Say something. But you know, sometimes, you know, police, are the, the, com the complice, you know, complicity with the state, you know, because in Tunisia when they attacked the cinema, because when, when they were screening, uh, wanted to screen my movie, you know, it, it was something like 200 meters from the uh, ministry of the, of the in, how do you say, interior in France, but I don't know how, from the police, and they, it, they took them something like 30 or 40 minutes, I don't know, because I was not there, I was in the hospital in France, and, uh, and uh, they took the police 40 minutes, you know, to come and arrest all these Salafists, you know, making all these threats to, to the, the audience, you know, to saying we, we were to, to, to cut your, uh, your throat and everything. Mm. And, you know, for me it was, let's them do this violence, and after the people will understand, you know. So sometimes the police uh, are really, uh, <laughs> yeah, complicit, you know, with the, 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 all this violence. And uh, you, 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 I, I don't want to speak about what happened in France this year, you know, with, the, the, with this uh, état d'urgence, but uh, the état d'urgence in France, it was a pretext, you know, to, to forbidden everything, you know, all demonstration, uh, not only about artists, but everything. And after Charlie Hebdo in France, they, they forbidden all the screening, not only my movie, a, a lot of movie like Timbuktu and everything, because they were afraid, you know? After Charlie Hebdo, it was the time to show those movies, you know? Mm. I think that censorship comes from fear, and you know, even in Australia, we don't have a lot of these 
issues particularly discussed in the mainstream, we still have police coming to art shows and shutting them down and taking the paintings that they deem are too controversial out of the building. Uh, and I think the response is partly what Nadia uh, emphasised, which is support the artists. I mean, they maybe they can stop that one exhibition, but they can't stop everybody. They can't censor the whole internet. We can repost those images. Yeah, yeah. We can show our support. We can support the artists. And like what Kate said, it's about the response, you know. There's our, our freedom of speech as well, is to respond and say, you know, these people who are against freedom of expression and against art, they are making their opinions very clear and so, you know, we can respond to that and say we don't accept that and, and, and support sure. artists and respond. Can I just say, um, having had a, a couple of experiences where things have blown up because of a piece of art or writing or a play that I've written, I think that so much of the problem is, is that none of the agencies really know what to do. So you have the police, the law, the, the institution that has produced the art, and they, they're just in a state of shock. Um, I know Index on Censorship are doing a lot of work to kind of bring people together and look at a way forward, but nobody takes responsibility. And I think we are getting to the point where arts organisations, particularly in this country, almost need freedom of expression policies um, where, where they know what to do because in all of these instances, the security is what trumps the art. Security, time and time again, trumps people's freedom of expression. And that cannot be right. And I think it's also because people just don't place value on art and on, and on what, what people want to say. I think that's something that really needs to be redressed. But having experienced it and having known lots of ex people who've experienced it, you end up with all of these different agencies who aren't, who just literally are very well-meaning and very intention, very well-intentioned, but they actually don't know what to do. They don't know how to make the work go on in a safe way. And I think that's really important to point out. Thank you. Okay, so on the first point, I think maybe this is a bit left field, but I, I think that essentially just corporate culture and the need for large amounts of money driving art is actually shutting free thought and freedom of speech down when it comes to art. So if it's a case if it comes to down to insurance, then, okay, what's the company saying yes or no on that? What are their motives? No, no one seems to be questioning this. And it seems to be part of a greater problem where the more power kind of corporations tend to have or the more kind of unethical power if you like governments tend to have the less able you are to express yourself as an artist and so what I think we're finding is that we've got censorship as a result of fear and it's symptomatic of a greater problem of corporate censorship so that's my first point um, the second one is about kind of the social justice warriors um, I have a term really for people who profiteer off of this um, to create outrage porn, and I call them offense ferrets. And I think what they tend to do is they tend to trawl the internet for anything they can possibly be offended about. And it's, it's come to me as well, as someone who apparently is too pale to comment on something, which I was a little bit pissed off about. Um, yeah, so, um, and what tends to happen is that actually these people who are calling cultural appropriation and saying that something is wrong, have they actually asked anyone from that particular culture? No, they haven't. Largely, they haven't. So um, I'll go back to the Katy Perry thing because this is uh, basically a, a linchpin here for me because I, I don't know about every other um, you know, incident of cultural appropriation or, or um, the fact thereof. But um, there was actually a Japanese guy on YouTube who decided to try and answer this burning question of if Japanese people really were offended by this. And... Um, he actually went round people in Japan and um, said, oh, are you upset that Katy Perry is wearing a kimono in a Western way? And he said, and actually went, no, this is great. We really wanted to carry on wearing this kimono. It's really cool. We actually really like the fact that she's helped, uh, you know, spread our culture. So why would you claim 
offence if you haven't actually asked any people from that culture first. So and what I would add to that is, so what, even if they're offended? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, so Kate, you'll have two minutes because you'll answer the questions and give us your final thoughts and then everybody else will have one minute each. Okay, um, so to talk about the exhibition, and I wanted to touch on what Shabana said about, um, about the haters and, and the, the, the antis, as it were, um, damaging her career. And I have exactly that, that I get booked for a show, people write to the organizers and say, oh, you can't put her on. It's really fun to be here because I know I'm not the most controversial person in the room. <laughs> it's great, welcome everyone. Um, the bottom line is this, it is a tiny minority of people who've got the time and the energy to go around stirring this kind of stuff up and the trouble is that the vast majority of people who support free speech and support whatever is going on don't take the time to spend a pound doing so or to spend five minutes doing so and if everybody in the world who supports free speech buys one more ticket, donates to somebody's Patreon site and all this kind of stuff, chips in a little bit, we are so massively outnumbered them. Even just go on YouTube and put a nice comment for once, it would be really refreshing. Um, <laughs> When it comes to social justice warriors, and I have to say, I, I, I'm almost uncomfortable with the acronym. I consider myself a social justice warrior. I want more freedom for women. I want more freedom for minorities. I want more rights for everybody. I want more social justice, if you don't mind. Um, and I, I'm, I'm all for those people who are trying to improve that and do these things. And do I expect them to get it right every time? No. Not in the slightest. I expect them to get it wrong over and over again, and they're welcome to, and I, I still consider them a part of my movement, and that's okay. They can get it wrong, and I can say that, and they can respond, and we're all cool. Let's keep going. I'm not going to let infighting among those of us who want a better world stop us from getting to that better world. Um, and that might be my, my final comment. Thank you. Anyone? Oh. <laughs> Uh, yes, the fear is there, but I believe that the art will always find a creative way to express itself. And I don't care if my English is not perfect, or I don't even care if my Urdu is so broken, but I think what I care about is that all of us have a goddamn right to laugh, to follow our hearts, to speak our minds, and... Uh, yeah, to defend a non-violent lifestyle, and we will keep doing that because we have no alternative. Yeah, just really gained a lot from this conference and want to congratulate the organizers for giving us an opportunity to connect with like-minded people and learn from each other and be part of this international secular movement and uh, also it's great that the conference is you know understanding the importance of art and artists and the power that that has to really challenge the status quo and 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 you know push that message out there so thank you um i just want to say um as the artist, you can, uh, I think you can, uh, don't ask any more permission to say whatever you want to say. Don't, and uh, you can break the law, you know, you can uh, uh, trans, trans, transgress, I transgress, I don't know if you can say it in English, <laughs> I'm sorry. And uh, I think our victory is to be alive now, you know. And I hope uh, uh, we can, um, for the next genera generation, we can uh, leave inheritance, you know, this um, love for struggle, for our rights, you know, and our rights is the, 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 right, the right thing to do, you know, to struggle for freedom and freedom of speech, uh, if, uh, of course, but for equality, and please translate the words, Mariam, laicity. <laughs> I think Nadia has launched a singular campaign, if anything, at this <laughs> event. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say that art is, in essence, provocative. It is provocation. 
And it makes me really sad that there are so many arenas at the moment that, that where that fit, that's not acceptable and that's not okay. Um, because if, we, if we're provoked, we just look in, we look at ourselves, we look at different corners of our mind and we learn things about ourselves. Um, and secondly, you know, I, I get offended by things. I don't mind if people are offended or I, th I think it's great that people protest and say they don't like stuff, but to, s to say that you want to shut something down is a whole different ball game, you know? And I find that really, really sad and really, really difficult. Um, and I just want to say also, I feel hopeful, you know? I feel really hopeful at events like this. I feel really hopeful and inspired by listening to different artists who I know are carrying on with their work. And when I was really little, my mum used to always say to me, be brave. And I think if you're brave in whatever sphere of life, you will discover something, whether it's about your art or about yourself, and that has to be a good thing. Well, I just think I'll close with this. Um, I think no matter how scared you are as an artist or an activist or how alone you feel, we have to realize in this room there is solidarity with all of us. We're all brothers and sisters here, and together we are stronger. So protect one another, love one another, support one another's art. Whether you're a secular artist, an atheist artist, an apostate or a blasphemous artist, we're out now. We need to keep going. Let's keep going. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Sarah Peace and the panel, thank you very much. It's been great. Do you want to say a final word? Yes, please. please yeah, I, I would just like to add one final word on offense and uh, come to the defense of Charlie Hebdo because anytime I've been at a secularist event like this there's always that defense of did you realize they were very hard left they were even members of the Communist Party and I keep thinking well even if they weren't we should still defend them you know even though we're all secularists and atheists you know it's to to choose not to defend them because they don't align politically with us undermines the very spirit of free thinking so um, um, yeah I just <laughs> hope that we can defend them without having to justify that they were on the left and not racist. It's really not necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and the team. Well done. Well done. Before we go to the next, um, thank you for the panel. Before we go to the next uh, 